Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today with longtime New Mexico journalist and friend of the Mercury, Peter Cattell, who has been writing all over the world for many years, including Mexico City and Miami and Washington, D.C. For, for Time Magazine, Newsweek, uh, Poder. For, uh, he's a translator for uh, the Paris-based uh, uh, Reporters Without Borders. And uh, he's written for the Mercury uh, a wonderful piece on New Mexico's role as a kind of um, as a kind of nursery, I guess, for uh, the anti-surveillance anti movement in America, which started here in about 1974. Here being one of the hotbeds of surveillance because, of course, of the Manhattan Project years before and uh, and our role in the Cold War. Peter's also written in other places uh, a marvelous piece on, on immigration f of children from Latin America. And we want to try and talk a little bit about that, too. So it's really wonderful to have you here with us, and uh, we look forward to a great conversation. Looking forward to it. So in the piece you wrote for us, um, you laid out this, this wonderful relationship between the man a lot of the Mexicans love, Godfrey Reggio, in his, in his Katsi series. Uh, and uh, the anti-surveillance movement in Mexico in 1974, which was actually sort of spearheaded by him as well. So I'd, I'd love you to kind of do a little recap on that. Sure. And then I'd like us to sort of move into the present and about where this, uh, and really about how prescient these guys were 40 years ago and, uh, and what's really sort of come to pass now. Well, what happened is uh, last year I suddenly remembered uh, at about the time that um, uh, Snowden uh, was was uh, leaking NSA surveillance secrets, I suddenly remembered the billboard that that uh, a bunch of people led uh, by Godfrey Reggio, the maker of Koyanis Katsi and the other two Katsi movies, uh, put up right near here, in fact, a big eye, and and it was a giant eye, kind of a menacing kind of look, and it and and it was part of this campaign they launched to try to awaken the New Mexicans to the dangers of surveillance and the threats to privacy that 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 uh, uh, mass surveillance uh, involved. They were so far ahead of their time that their campaign has been basically forgotten. And so what I tried to do in that piece, which I'm, I'm glad you, I'm, I'm honored that you published it, is, is, is kind of bring, the, bring this back to life and point out that the issues they raised were many of the same issues that are on the, on the front page almost every day today. It, I, to try to boil down the sort of complicated ideas they were putting across, um, they said that technology, computer technology, which was barely in its, in its infancy at the time, was enabling government and, and corporations to shift from what had always been the, the way that surveillance worked, which was the targeting of individuals who, for whatever reason, were of interest to governments or companies, and following them and opening their mail and what have you, that computer technology was going to allow this to expand to the point that everybody was being watched, uh, that all of their communications were being scooped up. One of their inspirations was George Orwell, and of mm -hmm. course 1974 was 10 years before 1984. And the other was a, 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 a French philosopher who's whom I had known only by name when I started on this piece, Jacques Ellul, who wrote in great and enormous profound detail about technology and man and the relationship between the two. And um, at any rate, they were so far ahead of their time, as I said, sometimes you can be too prescient. And the campaign I, was made, a, made, I think, a big splash in New Mexico Looking back on the materials that Godfrey made available to me, and I was working on the piece, there were there were big articles in in the journal which 
which published for 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 pay a newspaper supplement that this privacy crew uh, uh, put together, written by a man named Dan Liebson, who was an associate of Godfrey's, and really was also helped help focus Godfrey's thinking on all of this. And um, and there there was a story in the Washington Post. There were the the New Mexico Civil Liberties Union, which was the sponsor of the campaign, got a big jump in membership, and then the kind of interest sort of faded. And meanwhile, <laughs> in New Mexico, <laughs> the computer industry was getting launched. Bill Gates moved here, I think, a year after this campaign uh, stopped. It was a campaign of a few months. And whether it, whether he even knew about it, I don't know. But the the very technology that, that Godfrey and his friends were warning about um, then became the technology that we're all familiar with that's making this conversation possible and and the warnings that they were that they were uh, issuing kind of you know they're they're now so so current that it's hard to realize that somebody that a group of people could have seen all this coming even before the technology was developed that allowed the, the sort of dark side of technology to become so obvious. So when I was uh, covering Tirina in 67, I guess, I went to a, I think it was called the first international convention of the Alianza down at the old uh, uh, convention center um, auditorium. And I noticed in the room, there were a bunch of guys up around, way up, way up high, and the bleachers up high, and they had these big boxes with them, and they were tape recorders, and they were from almost all the intelligence agencies in the country, from, from the Coast Guard to the Marines to, to the Secret Service. And then, I think I was 26 or 27, it suddenly dawned on me, well, yes, of course New Mexico would be a hotbed of, of surveillance and, uh, and spying, and that's because, of course, we're the first target here in the Cold War, and, and we have you know, a huge FBI presence here. All the rest of it, why is that? Because of the National Labs, obviously. So that was really dense. But in 19, 1974, it was a tiny bit more obvious. And when everybody started to think about that eye, it really was so vivid. Uh, and, uh, but of course, nobody had any idea what that actually, I mean, they did. I certainly don't know what this could mean. So Jacques Ellul, um, um, he sort of nailed it. You know, technology is purposeless. It is. It exists as a tool. You use it. Um, so I'm. So I'm wondering if you might. You know, we're old news guys. I guess older than we <laughs> would like to be at the moment. But, but uh, I wonder what the. I wonder really what the, what the, motive is behind this new kind of scooping up of information is about. Is it simply the technology saying, you can do this, so, so we'll do it? Or, um, or are they actually doing it on purpose? And to what end? Well, from my non-expert perspective, uh, I, one of the interesting things to me is that the, the big intelligence presence in New Mexico that existed here from the days of the Manhattan Project, as you point out, um, it it didn't stop the Soviet penetration right. of the of the Manhattan Project, Absolutely. and in fact, just the other day, um, the uh, the Amer the um, secrecy project of the uh, Federation of American Scientists came across a history of the intelligence operation at Los Alamos. Which I guess was it must have been must have been written before the extent of Soviet penetration became obvious, and they talked about all the enormous successes they'd had in ferreting out drunks and you know incompetence and wow. suspicious people. So and yet when it came to the real spies who were the real deal, uh, they weren't that successful. Then. Uh, 2001, as we know, the the people who 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 perpetrated the 9/11 attack were all under surveillance of one kind or another. 
But, and people talk about the dots not being connected, but there were plenty of dots. The 9-11 Commission went on into all this in, in enormous detail. And so it strikes me that maybe one reason you say the technology allows you to do this, so you do it. And I, and I think that's right. And I think that another reason has to be that if you're working in a, in a law enforcement or intelligence bureaucracy, and you have the capacity to get information, even vast amounts of it, well, you're going to do it because you don't want to be the guy when the next thing happens, whom they say, well, wait a minute, he had the chance to get, you know, the, the phone metadata from Albuquerque <laughs> or wherever, and he didn't do it. So if the technology makes it possible, you're going to use it. It just, if for no other reason than to protect your job. And, and I think, you know, to, to give them some credit, um, they, they, I, th I think they, they're, they're, they'd like to protect the country. They, they, don't want, they don't want another disaster on their watch. And, and the technology makes um, scooping up information apparently so easy that um, if it's there, you're going to use it. You know, we're, uh, I think you know we're all kind of aware of the of the uh, the Red Squad business that you know, that was up in Denver and Chicago and other places, and here too, where police departments in in their archaic genius were clipping stuff about politicians and shady characters of all kinds. You and me, probably, I'm sure, or anyway, that's probably self-aggrandizing. Um, but this kind of impulse is always going on. I'm wondering. Now, take for instance, after this, uh, uh, the demonstrations about the police shootings in Albuquerque, where there was, you know, a spy at one of these things, uh, a police officer uh, who was tape recording people, and I think it was, they saw one guy. I'm sure there were a lot more because that's that's their practice. Um, I'm wondering how much this this sort of international global. Uh, scooping of information is going to start to uh, to penetrate uh, local issues and local people around local issues. I wonder if it's uh, I wonder if it's flexible enough to get pointed like that or not. Well, I I assume that um, in any sort of political and social movement that any police department in any country in the world is going to take an interest and is going to surveil in one manner or another. I, th this has always been true, at least in the modern world, and I think it always will be true. And as the tools get better to do it, those tools will be used. And I, I, I mean, we could get into a big argument about the rights and the wrongs, and, um, yeah. and, and, and there are, you know, the, the ACLU and people like that are better qualified than I to speak about the, the limits that uh, law enforcement agencies are supposed to observe, but that they're going to be, it, it, are supposed to observe when they, when they conduct these activities, but that they're going to conduct them in one way or another, I think it's kind of obvious. Uh, I, when I grew up in New York in the 50s and 60s, the, the police department outfit was called the Bureau of Special Services, and I'm before that, boss, and before that, I think there was something else. I mean, this, it's just, it's the world we live in. Yeah. And um, on, on the good side, <laughs> at least in this country, at some point, you often, you often find out about it. Um, there is, at least in theory, some expectation of transparency. Some, some people will, will call me naive for saying that. But there are countries where um, the, the, the surveillers have no limits on what they can gather, how they can gather it, and, um, and you don't find out about what they've gotten unless, as happened when the Soviet bloc collapsed, uh, all the Stasi files got opened in East Germany and everybody found out who'd been informing on everybody else. But that had been going on for decades. So. It's, I, I'm afraid that is kind of the world we live in. The implication of, of the anti-surveillance movement in 1974 was that 
indeed, if we were aware of this happening, we might do something to prevent it. Uh, it seems like, one, we were aware of it, but not enough of us were aware of it. It seems like, indeed, as you mentioned, the spirit of New Mexico leads to this kind of interaction because of our plurality, because of the, in, the incredible amount of inventiveness and great creativity in our state. Uh, and uh, but so, but uh, it didn't. It didn't lead to anything. Uh, it couldn't stop the technology, any more than any more than than uh, going on the Scotsy could somehow put the world back in balance. Um, but but what did they? What did they actually see? And I'm I'm embarrassed to say I don't know what their conclusions were. Did they have a program? of action uh, that might be revived? A program of action? Well, I, I believe their, their intent, their, their belief was that by calling attention to the dangers that the technology was making possible, that they would, they would lead citizens to, to um, question what was being done. And it, no, that didn't, that didn't take off. And it, um, and I think one reason is that the technology is seductive and, and in, in many ways very useful. I'm able to, to work in New Mexico remotely, <laughs> thanks to the Internet, yeah. as are many other people. And um, we all now get a lot more information more easily than we used to. Yeah. So all of this is good. And, um, and, you know, as prescient as, the, as, as Godfrey and, and Liebson and the others were, I don't think they quite saw that. I don't think they saw that information technology could be a blessing as well as a curse. Um, but it, it is true at the same time that many people are now coming around to the vision they had way back when that the technology is now so embedded in our lives that there's a, a very good question about whether we control the technology or the technology controls us. This is, this is Godfrey's big question. And, and it's, I don't have the answer, but it's, it's sure worth debating. And, and oddly enough, as I was you know, getting ready to come here, I got on, on the internet, I came across a, a piece, an excerpt from a new book by Nicholas Carr, in which he says in words that almost come out of the, I don't mean that he took them, but could have come out of the supplement that, that the privacy campaigners published, when an inscrutable technology becomes an invisible technology, would be, we would be wise to be concerned. At that point, the technology's assumptions and intentions have infiltrated our own desires and actions. We no longer know whether the software is aiding us or controlling us. And, you know, uh, Godfrey and his friends, as I say, didn't, they didn't see everything. They didn't see that people would open themselves up to surveillance with Facebook and, and, and social media. But they did get that. They did understand that technology was changing our relationship to the world and that we should be asking ourselves <laughs> how we want those changes to, to manifest themselves. So, you know, I, I was reading the other day from, um, I can't remember the name of the conservative Washington-based uh, um, blog, but it, it was talking about how uh, Cuban spies were infiltrating American campuses to try and uh, um, sign on leftist professors to spy for Cuba. And I got to thinking about that. And, and I, you know, I wrote something, I think, nasty about it as usual. And, uh, but I got to thinking about old thinking in the hands of new technology. Yeah. So uh, this is very old, very, very old thinking. And then you mentioned something to me as we were talking before uh, uh, before we went on camera that 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 the uh, the force 
immigration of children out of Latin America, uh, forced by circumstances, also has a very strange sort of twist in another way, in that Cuban refugees can move into the United States almost at will uh, because, because of certain agreements we've made. Could you talk about that a little bit sure. in the context of old stuff <laughs> in, in a new world? And um, to, to help with this transition, I mentioned that Orwell was one of the uh, inspirations for uh, for the privacy campaign in in a very obvious way because of 1974, 1984, but also um, because despite what some people may have thought, Godfrey and his friends, or most of them, were not dogmatic leftists. And Orwell, of course, uh, was was famous for having pointed out the dangers of the Soviet system. 1984 was based on Stalin's Russia. Big Brother was Stalin. Goldstein was Trotsky. Uh, Orwell was terrified that the Soviet surveillance system was going to was going to become a, a worldwide commonplace. Um, so switching to Cuba, which which is still marked by its its years of uh, Soviet alliance and the political culture is very Soviet, that's a place where people get surveilled and people get reported on uh, routinely. Whether, um, as this Washington uh, website reported, there's systematic infiltration of American campuses, I I don't know. It would certainly not be impossible, however, and, and anybody who's dealt with the Cubans, they're, they're proud of their intelligence services. They're, and, um, they, and they have had some successes along those lines. The, the chief, uh, I think, Cuba or Latin America analyst for the Defense Intelligence Agency was a Cuban spy who was found out only after many years. And she'd been recruited, I think, on a campus, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. Johns Hopkins. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but anyway, so Cuba is, all, people don't think about Cuba in the context of this wave of migration from Central America, which has been going on for, for, for quite a few years now, ever since the civil wars and turmoil of the 1980s, in which the U.S. played a big part. Um, all of this has come to a head because of all these unaccompanied children who've been coming this year. I, I think the numbers are down now, but something like close to 60,000 have come this year. But also uh, coming uh, via land are Cubans, I think 14,000 this year, because uh, if Cubans can leave Cuba and come to Mexico or somehow make their way to the Mexican border by land, um, they are admitted into the U.S. virtually automatically and get virtually automatic permanent residence uh, by way of the Cuban Adjustment Act, which was a 1966 law, which, of course, came out of a time when Cuba-U.S. relations were extremely hostile. And so the U.S. wanted to encourage Cubans to leave. But the odd thing is, it's so does the Cuban government, in a way, because all those Cuban refugees... However, there's quite a few of them, and their children are helping keep Cuba afloat. Something like two billion dollars worth of goods uh, have have gone into Cuba per year in in recent years, thanks to Cuban refugees or whatever you want to call them, uh, in Miami and elsewhere. At, to the point that the Cuban government is now restricting the uh, number of products that Cubans visiting Cuba can take with them, TVs and, and underwear, I mean, you name it, uh, they, they need everything. Uh, they've cut down on the number of products that Cubans can bring in because they want Cubans to, to, to bring in cash instead because they can, the, the Cuban government, it, it gets added to their reserves and they, they charge more for, for cash uh, um, remittances. Um, so the, the overall point here is that Cuba is very different from the Central American countries that are bringing all these refugees. And yet, in, in other ways, it, it's responding to this. It, it has a not dissimilar relationship with the United States in its own peculiar way. There's a, there's a relationship of hostility politically, 
And yet the Cuban and the U.S. government have an arrangement whereby Cubans can apply for visas in Cuba. And because many of them don't qualify as refugees, there's a, there's a visa lottery. Up to 20,000 Cubans a year can, can come to the United States if they get visas. And many of them get them by way of a lottery. And, and if they are caught at sea, they're returned to Cuba by the Coast Guard. But if they, can, if they can make it to land, maybe through Mexico or some other way, they can be admitted to the United States and stay here. And this is a safety valve for the Cuban government in just the same way that refugees from Mexico and Central America are a safety valve for those governments. And just like Central American and Mexican immigrants send money and goods back to their home countries, that's what Cubans do. So, yes, Cuba, U.S. relations are different, but in some ways they're just the same. All this stuff with Cuba and the existence of our embargo on, on, on goods and services to Cuba seems to be, you know, we all want the world to be rational and, and it makes sense, and most of the time it's irrational. It doesn't make sense if everybody, I think everybody comes to that same conclusion. But one of the the really the awful, painful things about irrationality is that sometimes many, 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 many people are being hurt terribly. I can't imagine a child, I can't imagine myself at six or seven years old, trooping through Mexico with a bunch of people who I don't know, ending up in the United States in a hostile environment, living in a dorm. I, I would have been paralyzed, I would have been traumatized for the rest of my life, and I'm sure these children will be too, most of them. What is the, how does this, how did this come to people to do this in the first place, and why? Well, I think you asked exactly the right question in exactly the right way, because it's often forgotten what, uh, what a, a terrible journey it is all the way up from Central America to the U.S. border. I, I've only seen a little bit of it. I w uh, 10 or 11 years ago, I was on the, on the uh, Guatemala, Guatemalan border with Mexico at a... At a refuge for migrants who were passing through on their way north. Um, and these were, at that point, these were not children. These were like young men. Um, and I, for children to do this and for adults to let them do it, I think what it tells you is that the conditions are so dreadful where they're coming from that they see no other alternative. Uh, you can argue in individual cases of adults that, well, okay, they want to make more money in the States or they have a sense of adventure. You can argue whatever you want, kind of, when it comes to adults. Uh, but children, for, for children to, to uh, be sent on a journey like this, the conditions where they are, you, I believe you have to conclude leave them with a sense that they have no alternative. And that gets into the, the terrible violence that's a, a part of life in Honduras and El Salvador and Guatemala, which the, the so-called Northern Triangle of Central America, and the, these are the countries that are behind this, this wave of, or wavelet of children. And, and there's, an, there's another group of children who come with their mothers. Uh, I don't have a number on, the, on, on them at the top of my head, but they are the ones who are being held in Artesia. Right, right, right. right. Uh, at, yes, the, yes. At, the, uh, at the sort of immigration or immigrant jail that's been set up at the Border Patrol uh, Training Center uh, in Artesia. Uh, and they, they get less attention, I think, because... <laughs> It's less dramatic, uh, but in fact, it's it's every bit as dramatic as far as I'm concerned. Sure. Mothers, mothers and small children, coming that that making that terrible journey and risking rape and robbery and death at the hands of all kinds of bandits along the way. It's really uh, it's really pretty grim, and I don't I I think it's probably mistaken to blame the United States entirely for all of for the conditions in Central America. The United States was deeply involved in all of those countries for many years. Um, 
but it's it's also fair to say the United States has something to do uh, with with uh, the conditions those countries are in, and that um, these countries are worse off than they were <laughs> when these wars all started. And the first of the, in our, in modern times, the first of those events was the Guatemalan coup, which the United States, the CIA organized in 1950. Oh God, is it 52 or 53? Um, and and uh, in, in, the, in the violence that followed uh, that military coup, for the next 30 years, something like 200,000 people were killed. And most of them were most of them were not on the government side. They were on the guerrilla side or were helpless civilians mm -hmm. caught up in all this. Uh, the, 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 the central, the gangs that are the, the sort of main actors in this violence, the, the so-called Maras, um, it's Mara Salvatrucha and then, and then the 18th Street gang who you know, heavily tattooed, ultra-violent, not nice people. That really got going when Salvadoran, young Salvadoran immigrants who'd come to the United States as little children in the 1980s during the Civil War were deported. They'd, they'd gotten into trouble with the law in, in the United States, often in Los Angeles, where this gang culture uh, has developed. And they were deported back to uh, El Salvador, mainly. and had had no roots left there and they and they 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 continued this and and developed this gang culture now which is kind of taken over in God. these in these countries so you know you can say that the united states was correct to deport people who break the law but uh, that aside it didn't have a good outcome no it didn't, <laughs> no, it, didn't. it didn't work right because what happened is they, they took all this violence that they'd learned on the streets of L.A. back to El Salvador, which, which had its own culture of violence. Yeah. And, uh, and there, wasn't, there wasn't anybody sort of trying to head this off. And Mike O'Connor, who was a journalist, a great journalist who died um, this year, um, he wrote about this first I knew of this was and he wrote about this in, in, in the New York Times in 1991 he mm -hmm. said these Salvadoran kids are being deported back home they've they've gotten into the gang culture in LA and it's a big problem it was talk about prescience yeah. by the way God. it wasn't wasn't quite like Godfrey and company but mm -hmm. he saw far ahead so you know um, one of the ways that a lot of us have gotten, uh, a view of what the reality is like in in Mexico and Latin America is through the repertorial brilliance of Chuck Bowden and and the you know the bloodbath the serious bloodbath that's been going on and you think about sixty thousand kids moving through internal checkpoints moving through uh, dozens of those things as they're all over Mexico, moving around with the, you know, with the soldiery and the corruption involved there, no food, no water, no, no. Uh, so the, I guess the, I guess the question is, is that, is that people in, in, in the Northern Triangle are so terrified at the moment and feel so completely helpless that their children are better off leaving there and going through this trial of really torture uh, uh, to get out of it. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what, what you've been thinking about and what you've been reading about proposed solutions to this. Well, solutions, that's never been my strong point. <laughs> um, but as we speak, the, I, I think it's this week the United States announced that it's going to allow uh, uh, children or young people in those three countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, to apply for refugee status in those countries. Uh, the United States has done this before. In, in Vietnam is the one that comes to mind, but there have been a couple of other cases. Normally, you apply for 
refugee status, which means asylum, once you get here, or or in a can you apply along the way if you're in a third country? I can't even I can't remember. Yeah. Immigration law is really complicated. Yeah. Um, uh, so now, whether the, I I just read a piece this morning that's that uh, basically made the case that this is not going to result in many children or many young people getting refugee status, and and that there are there's an issue if what you're worried about is violence and and gangs forcibly recruiting you into gangs, which is the sort of most common thing you hear about, at least as far as boys are concerned. Um, what, why would you feel safe in going to an American installation that that's everybody's going to know about and that a gang can easily keep an eye out yeah. uh, or keep an eye on? Speaking of surveillance, yes, by the exactly, way, exactly. governments aren't the only people who can do this. No, exactly. Um, and I think that's a that's a legitimate question. I, maybe maybe somebody's figured out a way around this issue, which is you don't have to be sort of Sherlock Holmes to see that this this could be a problem. Maybe great minds are working on this, but as of right now, as far as I know, this is it's a question. So I guess just like uh, guns being tools, that can be used anyway. Surveillance equipment and and expertise. Uh, it's all. Also, tools they can be used by anyone. I'd honestly never sort of thought of, of gang surveillance, but of course, I'm sure those those holding areas are riddled with spooks of one kind or another. I mean, that's that's the nature of the species, I guess. So, do you have any any final things that <laughs> that kind of wrap up these two things together? Do you think? I mean, I think that I think that insight about about surveillance. As a um, as a habit of culture permeating all all kinds of subcultures is really devastating. Actually, New Mexico is the place to consider these issues because uh, because this this has been a, a center of technological innovation because it's been a center of technological innovation of of interest in the in the Cold War and because we're we're in the Americas, and we know it. I think elsewhere in the country, you you read about people in the Deep South who who are are stunned that suddenly half their town is Latin American, uh, and it, understandably, I, you know that that they would sort of wonder what happened here. And I think in New Mexico, whatever people may think about immigration and whether they think immigrants take jobs or whether that's a good thing or, you know, lower wages. All these are, are, are valid issues to talk about. But I think at least people here, whatever they may think about these things, they understand that we're in this region and um, we used to be, this state used to be part of Mexico and so did our, a couple of our neighbors. And I, th I think people here understand that this is a, it's a legitimate uh, immigration, even if you don't like it, immigration can be a legitimate response to what's going on in your home country, especially if where you're immigrating to is has a culture that's not all, that's not completely dissimilar from the culture you come from. I mean, New Mexico is part of the United States, and you know people speak English here and all that, but not everybody speaks English, and and we are a, a transition state between Latin America and the United States, and it's I think it is it not one reason that there were some in Congress who didn't want New Mexico to be a state because <laughs> they're worried about all those Mexicans. Well, that's part of our tradition here; it's part of the culture, and uh, so I think we're in a sort of great place to to ponder these questions. So as the old, old saying goes, somos Aztlan. We are the... <laughs> um, you know, also, if, if New Mexico um, is the right place to think about surveillance, and I totally agree with you, it is, uh, we're also the right place to start to think about what is and what will become a massive worldwide phenomenon, a movement 
of people uh, a global diaspora if for no other reason than than climate change. Uh, there's going to be a, I mean, if this all pans out the way we're terrified that it might, uh, people will be on the move everywhere. And what happens here and how we handle it here has a lot to tell us about about the future. I don't think we're handling it well here. Uh, but um, I think this is also the place to think about these matters. Well, I, you, are, you are absolutely correct. And the one, one advantage we have in New Mexico, I think, is that people here have been thinking about these things for a long time. Yes. Um, I, I get the sense that in California, for instance, which is now hit by a serious drought, People are, not all people, but many people there are just waking up to the fact that um, they didn't have a lifetime assured supply of water there because they're in the desert. I think people in New Mexico have known for a long time that water is a scarce resource and that you can't take for granted that it's going to be around forever. I think whatever political opinions people may have in New Mexico, I think there's a general understanding that water and and sun and all <laughs> well I guess the sun will be around as long as we are but but um, that that water that you you can't take nature for granted and and I I think in that sense we're we're ahead of the curve maybe in the same way that Godfrey and company or hopefully in the same way that Godfrey and company were were ahead of the curve in in investigating the the potentials of mass surveillance, and um, also hopefully, people's thinking about water conservation and water use will not fade <laughs> in the same way that unfortunately the the privacy campaign faded a little bit. Um, and and I believe you're right that this ties to migration as well. It it, it is a reason that it historically the species has always migrated and whether people will be coming to New Mexico or leaving New Mexico that's there's a, a question that I don't have an answer to yeah. <laughs> what a wonderful conversation truly thank you so much it's been a joy to talk with you and I look forward to doing it again in the future the pleasure is all mine I, ho I hope I didn't ramble too much <laughs> and it, it's been great it's been a real pleasure speaking with you